Hello and welcome to a live interaction with National Marine Sanctuaries and Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants. You are in the right place if you are looking to explore the depths of American Samoa. We will begin promptly at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hello, everybody, and welcome again to our live interaction with National Marine Sanctuaries and Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Today, we have with us Joe Grabowski from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, Hannah and Val, the research team at National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa, and we are going to turn it over to Joe from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants to give us a rundown of today's program. All right, awesome. Thanks so much, Hannah. Uh, great to be joining everyone live today. Welcome to today's live interaction with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. As Hannah mentioned, my name is Joe Grabowski and I'm from Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants and I'll be uh, your host for today. Before we jump into things, I'm just going to share my screen quickly and I'd like to show you a little bit about Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants uh, so you can check out uh, the events that we do uh, if you're interested. So that should be sharing now. There we go. So if you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, you can find the website. We bring science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and around the world through virtual uh, guest speakers and field trips. We normally run 30 to 50 live events a month for classrooms, but we've been running three to four events every day since uh, schools have closed for people at home, parents, students, educators to meet scientists and explorers from all over the world. If you scan down the page, you can find a spot to sign up for the newsletter, so you'll be kept up to date with all the new events that are coming up. And a small sneak peek at a few events coming up will be, uh, today we were live with the Turtle Hospital um, and at Ripley's Aquarium uh, doing seahorse feeding, so you can check out some recordings of those. Coming up, we'll be live at the Toronto Zoo on Thursday, and then World Otter Day is coming up on the 27th. So lots of cool events uh, that you can check out. I also want to put on your radar the Global Biodiversity Festival. So starting Friday, the 22nd to the 24th, we are hosting 60, over 60 scientists, explorers, conservationists, policymakers, photographers, and filmmakers from all over the world for a free live virtual festival. So that website's globalbiofest.com. I'll put all these links uh, in the chat bar so you can check them out. But it should be an absolute blast meeting some of these incredible people on the front line of conservation protecting our biodiversity all across the planet it's going to be an absolute blast so one more thing to talk about for today's call we will have a slido room uh open today so what does that mean that means that you can take part in some interactive surveys that we're going to have during the event so i have this little slide up here for you to see you can go to slido it's www.sli.do we'll take you to slido and the event code for today is samoa there is also a direct link, which I will share in the question bar shortly. And I've even put up a little QR code here. So if you're near the computer, you have your phone handy, you can scan this QR code and you'll be brought into the room and you can take part in some of those survey questions there. So lots of ways to join interactively and I will pop those into uh, the chat. So I'm gonna come back from that screen share now and let's get today rolling. So we're taking a virtual field trip into the depths of the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa with research team members, Valerie Brown and uh, Hannah Spathis. So uh, I'm gonna throw things over to Hannah again. She's education specialist with NOAA's Office of Marine National Sanctuaries and she's gonna take us on a little trip. Awesome, thank you for the introduction, Joe. 
We are going to be talking with Val and Hannah later today, but first I want to go into an overview of the National Marine Sanctuary System. We are a network of 14 National Marine Sanctuaries and two Marine National Monuments that encompass over 600,000 square miles of marine waters. We protect special places that protect shipwrecks to corals to incredibly unique deep, deep sea ecosystems. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna take you on a virtual tour of our National Marine Sanctuaries. Starting, oh, I, we're gonna start in the most Northwest corner in Olympic Coast, but I also want you to know that this is super engaging. We want you participating in this live interaction. So we're gonna kick it off with a few slide out questions. So we want to know if you are watching this live stream with anybody else, and if so, how many? So this is again on the Slido that Joe has dropped in the chat box, um, as well as slido.com with the event code Samoa. All right, so we've got a few votes starting to come in. People are finding the Slido room. Let's see what we're looking like so far. Um, no, some good social distancing going on. We've got a couple singles and a couple pairs hanging out uh, for the awesome. event so far today. And Joe, have you been able to drop the link into the chat? I personally don't see it. Oops, it's there now. I forgot to hit enter. Awesome. So if you've been confused about where Slido is, the chat is now in the it is now in the chat in the control panel. So you can click that link directly. And if you click it in time, we have another Slido question. Have you heard of NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries before today's live interaction? All right, I'm gonna give a couple seconds. Our numbers are climbing really fast. Uh, but so far, we're seeing a nice little trend here that a lot joining in have definitely heard of the sanctuaries before. We're up over 90%. Uh, Ooh, nice. Awesome. Well, I'm going to then start with our virtual tour. We are starting in the most northwest corner in Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, where you can see the sea star here enjoying the biodiversity of a tight tidal pool. Moving on, we have Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary in Northern California, where elephant seals are known to go on the beach. Right bordering Greater Fairlands is Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, which protects really unique deep, deep sea coral environments. Just south of that, we have Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which on a previous expedition in both 2018 and 2019, they stumbled across a brooding octopus garden, which you see here in this photo. Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary is just off the shore of Santa Barbara, California, protects lush kelp forest. And moving all the way over to the Pacific, we have Papahanao Mokukea Marine National Monument in Hawaii, which is the largest marine conservation area in the world. We have Hawaiian Island Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary, which protects the breeding grounds for this key species. And we also have, which we'll learn a ton more about today, the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa, even further west in the Pacific. Coming back to continental US, 100 miles off the coast of Galveston, Texas, we have Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, which happens to protect some mantas. Going to, down to Florida, we have Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, which protects the Florida Keys Reef Tract. Going further north in the Atlantic, we have Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Georgia, which protects live bottom reef habitats. Here we have the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary off, off North Carolina, which happens to be the very first National Marine Sanctuary established in order to protect the USS Monitor, a Civil War era shipwreck. From there, we go to Mallows Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary in Maryland. Now this National Marine Sanctuary is very special because it is the most recent National Marine Sanctuary designated only in November of 2019. As you can see from this photo here, it protects shipwrecks again. 
very uniquely looking shipwrecks. These ones are half above the water, so great place to explore if you're a paddler. Moving further north, we have Stellweg and Bank National Marine Sanctuary, which is in Massachusetts Bay, well known for their whale watching. And even in the Great Lakes, we have a freshwater National Marine Sanctuary that protects over 200 shipwrecks, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So now that we've gone on a virtual tour, have you ever visited a National Marine Sanctuary before? All right, so I'm gonna give one more reminder about the Slido. If you uh, use your search bar, it's sli.do, a very easy uh, website to find. And then the event code for today is Samoa. And let's see, we've got about 100 people in the room so far and 55% have visited before a National Marine Sanctuary. Awesome. Well, that is a lucky group of people. That's great. Um, moving on, I want, now that you know the place, I want you want to tell you a little bit about what a National Marine Sanctuary does. So I use the word protect a lot. They protect sea giants like this humpback whale, all the way down to the small sea life, like small reef fish and coral reefs. We are protecting places with abundant biodiversity. We are protecting places that are the shelter for some of the most charismatic marine species like this endangered Hawaiian monk seal and this green sea turtle. Like I've mentioned, we also protect maritime heritage like this shipwreck in Thunder Bay. And we're also mandated under the National Marine Sanctuaries Act to do resource protection. And in order to do resource protection, we're also mandated to do education and outreach to encourage the next generation to understand what National Marine Sanctuaries are and what they can do to sustainably protect them. These are our special marine places. There are places to enjoy through paddling, fishing, snorkeling, boating, and surfing. So all in all, these are your places to enjoy, to explore, to tr cherish, and we get to learn more about the depths of them today. Ooh, here we have another tricky Slido question. I've only mentioned this once in this presentation, and it was at the very beginning. So Joe, how many people were listening to how many square miles the sanctuaries encompass? All right, we're a little... A little lower than usual, 63% who are on the ball today. So they'll have All to be right. ready well, for the next survey question. The correct answer is 600,000 square miles. So over 600 square miles are protected waters within the National Marine Sanctuary System. So before we dive into American Samoa, I wanna tell you a little bit about why American Samoa was chosen as an exploration site. So in 2019, NOAA awarded a grant to Ocean Exploration Trust, as well as Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration to conduct telepresence research in National Marine Sanctuaries. Now, telepresence is a unique word. We're gonna break it down to meaning ship to shore. So these cruises and these explorations were able to bring what was happening, the research that was happening in the deep sea to land. We were able to see in real time what the explorers were seeing. So with American Samoa, the Nautilus, the vessel, the research exploration vessel that Ocean Exploration Trust operates, visited the waters of American Samoa, as well as other national marine sanctuaries last year, and had an ROV, stream the feed in real time to shore for both other scientists and the general public to take part in the expedition. I'm gonna turn it over now to Val, the research coordinator at American Samoa, and Hana, the, re the research specialist at the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa, to tell us a little bit more about what they found there. Thanks, Hannah and Joe, for having us. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so my name is Val Brown. I'm the research coordinator here at the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa. And let me just get our presentation up. Oh, 
And Hannah, feel free to share your webcam and unmute yourself whenever you are ready. Okay. Are we showing now, Hannah? Yep, that was Perfect. Okay. So, talofa, everyone. That's how we say hello here in American Samoa. Um, American Samoa is located in the South Pacific Ocean and is the only inhabited U.S. territory in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, which makes the, the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa uh, the only U.S. sanctuary south of the equator. And we used to be the smallest sanctuary, and that was called Fungatali Bay National Marine Sanctuary. But in 2012, it expanded, and now we include six units that stretch from the remote Swains Island in the north to three units around the main island of Tutuila, and then east to Ta'u, and then farther east to the Moliaba unit, which is our biggest unit, which includes Rose Atoll and the Vailu uh, Seamount. So I have a question for you guys to start off with. How big do you think that, sanct that our sanctuary is? Do you think it's 0 0.25 square miles, 203 square miles, 13,581 square miles, or 2 miles? million square miles. All right, so just a heads up to our viewers, now is the time to slide back into the Slido room. We have the new survey questions open. I'm going to give a few seconds to get some of those results coming in. They're coming fast. Let's see what people are thinking so far. All right, 50% have gone with 13,581 square miles. Are they right? They are right. It's 13,581 square miles. But we started out at just 0 0.25. So it's been a lot of growth over the last few years. And that means that we are responsible for managing a wide range of habitats now from shallow coral reefs in the sunlight layer of the ocean to the mesophotic or twilight zone areas, all the way down to the deep sea and sea maps. Today, our expedition is going to focus on those deep zones um, up to a little bit of the mesophotic. But let's take a quick look through all of our habitats so you guys have an idea of what we do here. One thing I want to note first before we start, and as you're looking through these pictures, is that light changes as we go deeper in the ocean. So at the top, there's a lot of sunlight and animals tend to be blue or to blend in with the ocean or bright colors. And as we go deeper, those colors are gonna change. Some animals will become clear, some will become um, red or black or even no color at all. Do you guys know why? We have another question for you. So do you think it's because they're boring do you think it's because it helps them blend into the dark, that they save energy by making color pigments, or a combination of B and C? All right, 73% have rolled with B and C. Excellent. You guys are so on top of things today. That's right. They're certainly not boring, but those coloration helps them blend into the dark and save energy. So let's guide you through some of our past expeditions here in American Samoa, and let's apply that knowledge. So here you, here you can see one of our beautiful shallow coral reefs in Fungatelli Bay. These areas are highly diverse with over 200 species of corals and hundreds of fish and invertebrate species. This is where Han and I do most of our work using scuba gear. Um, and it's really important um, for these animals, the corals, to have sunlight because they actually have little tiny plants inside that give them extra energy to build these great big reef structures that are visible even from space. Now here in this area, you'll see a lot of different colors and shapes and sizes. So sometimes the animals have bright colors to, to signal other animals that they're toxic. Um, sometimes it's to blend in with their coral homes. Well, there's lots of light here. Um, as we go deeper, you're going to notice that some of that light disappears. And the first one to disappear is red. 
And then as we go deeper, things will get bluer and bluer until the, finally there's no light at all. So as we go a little bit deeper, our partners from the Bishop Museum, NOAA, and also Papahana Mokuakea use special um, dyed gear called rebreathers to go deeper. So this picture here is about 300 feet in Fangalua, Fongamaa. Um, you can see how blue everything looks, and they have to bring some light down to help see. This zone is known as the twilight zone or mesophotic zone. There's, there's light here, but not as much, and you'll notice that those corals look different. But the fish still look a little bit similar, so we still see some of the shallow reef species in this area, but we also see some different species. As we go even deeper, we have to use some additional tools like ROVs and submersibles. And you'll see that these fish are still a little bit familiar looking, but they're now shifting colors. And the corals are a little bit smaller. And that sea cucumber is almost clear. And when we finally get down to the very bottom of the abyssal plain on the ocean floor, it's pretty boring. There is mostly sediment that's caused by detritus falling from the surface. And there's not a lot of places for animals to attach to. Corals and sponges need hard substrate. The good thing for us is that if we go a little bit across that abyssal plain, we get to seamounts or ridges along um, our island. And these are rocky formations formed by undersea volcanoes that reach up towards the sky. And um, they provide a really good place for these animals to attach. So along these seamounts, we'll see things like this beautiful deep sea coral. And these grow really, really slowly um, because there's no sunlight down here. They don't have little plants inside to help them grow. So some of these corals in the deep sea can be thousands of years old. One of the important things they do is provide a home for other animals. And as we explore, you're going to see things like sea stars and crabs living in the branches of these corals. But we also see other types of animals. So we have a soft sponge there on the left, an almost translucent anemone. And some of the fish look a little bit strange down here. And you'll notice that a lot of them are dark. OK, are you guys ready to go explore? Now you got a little bit of information. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Hannah. And she is going to tell us all about the Nautilus expedition last year. Take it away, Great. Hannah. Thank you, Val, and thank you to Joe and Hannah for having us today. We're very excited to be here. Uh, hello for everybody. My name is Hannah Spatius. I'm the research scientist at the Sanctuary of American Samoa, and I was co-lead and lead scientist aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus ship for this research cruise. So this ship is owned and operated by the Ocean Exploration Trust, um, who Dr. Robert Ballard started. And for those of you who don't know, he is the gentleman that discovered the Titanic. It's a pretty cool guy. Um, this ship is 211 feet long. It can map the sea floor while underway, and it also has a data and a wet lab on board. So in 2009, this ship went all over the Pacific Ocean. Can you switch over, Val? I don't know if there's a delay. And so in 2009, this ship went all over the Pacific Ocean. Today, we're going to focus on the American Samoa leg of the cruise, which is shown in the red arrow on the bottom. So the goal of this research cruise was to map and explore the deep sea and the mesophotic environments with a focus within the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa. So on board the ship, there was two remotely operated vehicles, also known as ROVs. So there's Hercules and Argus, and they work in tandem. They're connected on the same cable line from the ship as shown on the photo on the left here. So Hercules, which is the larger ROV in yellow, weighs just over 5,000 pounds, which is the equivalent of about four adult cows. So it's pretty heavy. And Hercules can dive to a max of 4,000 meters or about two and a half miles. It has the capability to collect water samples, sediment samples. It has a sample box and a manipulator arm to grab those samples. It also has big bright lights to be able to see the seafloor and multiple cameras attached to it. And as Hannah mentioned before, one of the really cool things about this expedition is that this ROV has live stream capabilities, which can be seen 
at nautiluslive.org. So for this research cruise, it was a partnership between NOAA, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and the Sanctuary of American Samoa with the Ocean Exploration Trust. In addition, we had local, our local American Samoa partners and scientists aboard the ship as well. We had someone from the Department of Marine and Wildlife Resources, the National Park of American Samoa, the American Samoa Community College, and University of Hawaii. And all of these people pictured here were the local scientists from American Samoa. I'd also like to mention Dr. Marika Suduk, who was not pictured here or on board the ship with us, but she was our lead scientist who planned this entire cruise. So in addition to all the local American Samoa scientists on board, there are also many other people that are needed to run a big research cruise like this. So some of those other people on aboard the ship include the Ocean Exploration Trust, the Science and Data Processing Team, the Navigation, Communication, Ship and ROV Engineers, the Cooks, and most importantly, the ship captain and the crew. So total, this vessel holds about 50 people to run the whole research cruise operation. So now we have a question for you guys. Do you wanna do this one, Val? Or Joe? Oh, sure. So everybody, if you were gonna go on one of these expeditions, what job would you like to do? Would you maybe like to be the ship captain, the ROV pilot, one of the scientists, um, a communication specialist talking to the people on shore, or maybe something else? And if something else, maybe you can type it into the chat box for it. All right, we've got lots of answers so far. 48% want to be the scientists on board. 29% think it would be pretty cool to be the ROV pilot. And surprisingly, only 8% want to be the captain, want to be in charge. All right, thanks guys for your answers. So now we are gonna go explore the deep sea, but first step is to plan the ROV dive. So we look at a bathymetric map to find the rocky bumpy areas because this is where you find the most sea life in the deep sea. So before and during the dive, the data manager and scientists and ROV pilots and the navigators and communication people, they sit in a room called the control van. Can we go to the next slide, Val, please? Next one. So in this room, they can view the footage from the ROV on these big TV screens, which is pretty cool. All right, so now the next step is for the ROV to get deployed off the side of the ship by a crane, which you see here in this photo. And now we're gonna take you guys on a dive off of Aonu'u. And this ROV dive was off the East Ridge near the Aonu'u Sanctuary Management Zone. Okay, give me just one second to get this switched over. Okay. And hopefully I have this all set. So I'm really excited about this dive, Hannah. Um, how deep are Hercules and Argus going to take us here along the slope in Anu? So this dive started at about 1,000 meters, which is just over 3,000 feet, or a little over a half a mile below the sea surface. Wow, that's deeper than the world's tallest building. And that means that there is no light down there, and the temperature is probably around 39 degrees Fahrenheit at the bottom. That's pretty cold. I'm pretty excited to see what's going on down there. You guys ready? Let's go. So this dive started in a sandy area, and this big shrimp here is one of the first animals that we saw. How can you tell how big it is? So those two green dots you see are from the lasers, and they're exactly 10 centimeters apart, or four inches. So we use those dots to tell how big something is. 
we followed the slope and came to a more rocky terrain. It was really steep, but we moved shallower and then we found some smaller shrimp. Ooh, and I see a glass sponge. Explorers, look close. Do you guys see anything inside of it? If you see it, yes, that's a shrimp inside. Hannah, did you know that these shrimp move into the sponge as babies, but then they get stuck inside as they grow? Yes, I actually think there's two in this one. I guess it keeps them safe, and hey, it's a pretty prison, right? This next part of the dive was really cool because we saw all these sponges and corals attached to the bottom of the seafloor. There's some really big basket stars on those sponges. It's hard to believe that they're related to starfish. Did you see a lot of these on the expedition? Yes, we did. There were a variety of basket stars, sea anemones, and other animals that we saw on top of sponges like this stall, tall stock sponge you see here. Cool. I really like that anemone at the bottom. It looks like a Venus flytrap. Because it's so dark down here, these animals can't see. So it means that all of them are getting food by filtering tiny little bits out of the water based on touch. And most of that's detritus from the surface or maybe a little bit of zooplankton. Oh, this was a neat find too. We saw this amazing jellyfish. It's a jellyfish from the genus Peralia. And if you guys look closely, you see those long looking tentacles in the center of it coming out from the middle. Those are what are called their oral arms. And if you look on the rim of the jellyfish, you can see there's tiny little tentacles. And when it zooms out, you'll see these little white hairs. Those are their tentacles. Wow. Explorers, do you notice what color it is? That's right. It's red, which would help it blend into the deep sea. Now here we have a nice big brittle star that's on this coral. They're also related to those basket stars and to starfish too. Whoa, look at that shrimp hanging out in this barrel sponge. <laughs> He's pretty cute. He probably is using that sponge as shelter from predators, but he could also be picking some food off of it. It's too bad we can't stay a little longer to see what he's up to. And then there was this big stock sponge. We saw some that were taller than a person or just as tall as a person. Wow. I'm really surprised that there aren't any other animals living on this one. Some of the stock sponge we saw did have other animals on it, but not all of them. And most of these species of sponges were white or yellow in color that we saw. Oh, I see. I guess they don't need those colors down in the dark. Oh, and anglerfish. These are some of my favorite deep sea animals. They're so weird looking. And this variety kind of walks around the bottom with special modified fins. Check that out. There were crabs and more basket stars at this step. Not all of them were attached to sponges or corals though like this one you see here. Do you guys see all the arms sticking out? Those arms have sharp hooks on them to catch zooplankton in the water. That's really interesting. You know what's also cool is that like starfish, they are able to regrow their arms if one is damaged or eaten. Whoa, check out this shark. Explorers, any guesses what species it is? If you said six-gill shark, you're right. These are rarely observed alive because they like these really deep waters. What a treat. It was cool, but then we kept climbing up. We were always on a tight schedule. Here, we're up to 175 meters and starting to see algae growing on the bottom now. 
Oh, I can see the pink coral and algae on the bottom. It's similar to what we see on the shallow reefs, and that means that there has to be some light down here to allow it to grow. Yes, and here's a beautiful black coral. Ooh. Did you know that some black corals are harvested for jewelry? But it's not very sustainable. These grow so slowly down here in the dark that one coral in Hawaii they found was 4,000 years old. Now, one of the other things that we see at this step in these mesophotic areas are um, sea sand. So these look super delicate, almost like lakes, but they're actually strong enough to stand up to some pretty strong currents. All the sea fans we saw were facing the same direction as you see here. This is because sea fans living sh in shallow or deep water, they grow perpendicular to the currents. And they do this so that they can catch their food as it floats past them in the currents. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Oh, and we can tell now that we're definitely getting shallower. These are urchins, and they like to eat algae. Um, there's a little bit of shimmer there, which suggests that the temperature is also changing as we come up. Yes, we noticed it got a lot warmer. Here we are up to 105 meters now, and there's a lot more light and life. It starts to look a lot more like what we are used to seeing in the shallow water reefs. Oh, yeah, and that looks like another shark. It looks like a silver tip. Nice. There's also some dog tooth tuna and a trevally swimming through. Oh, and lots of reef fish down near the bottom. Be sure to check out that shark if it comes through again. Oh, and check out these tuna. This is so great. There's so much life down here. Yes, but unfortunately, the ROVs couldn't operate in shallows for too long because it gets too warm. So we ended the dive there and brought Hercules and Argus back on board, which you can see here in this end of the footage. Wow. Explorers, what do you think? Was that exciting or what? We do have another question for you now. So, where did you see more animals during our dive? Was it down on the abyssal plain at over 900 meters? Was it along that first deep ridge at about 600 meters? along the mid-depth ridge where we got a little shallower at 300 meters or up in the shallows of the mesophotic where we were at, where we were just at all right 58 percent tuning in thought it was the mesophotic so around 100 meters well cool. yes there's definitely a lot more light there which means that there's algae and more food because it's closer to the surface so we do see tend to see more animals up in the shallows. Okay, Hana, where else did you guys go on this trip? All right, so now I'm gonna go through and give you all some a highlight from some of our other dives. So here in this slide, you see we went to Swain's Island and the exciting thing about this dive is that we collected the first rock sample ever, which was very exciting for us and especially for all the geologists. In Ta'u, we found large deep canyons between lava rock flows like you see here. They were very tall and steep. And then at Rose Atoll, we saw very dense areas of sea whips. And one of the most exciting parts of this whole research cruise was to be able to dive the active by Lulu Seamount since it's always changing, the shape of the crater and the sea life living inside of it. So when we got there, we remapped the crater before the dive to see if there were any big changes since the Okeanos Explorer was last there back in 2017. And when we compared the old map with the new map, we found no big changes in the shape of the crater, but we did see something new. So if you see in the photo here, there's that purple circle on the northeast corner of the Nafanua crater. So that is where we saw some distortion on the new map. And within that purple circle, we thought that distortion may point to signs of a new active hydrothermal vent. But 
before exploring to see if it was, we first went to the Nafanua Kum. Next slide, please. So as we cl climbed the Nafanua Cone, we saw these really cool, large, round lava rock formations. We saw some soft coral there, and we saw these eel-like fish swimming, which were about a half a meter long. And after exploring the Nafanua Cone, we then went to explore the northeast corner to see if there was, in fact, a new hydrothermal vent. So now we're going to take you all on another dive to see if we found a new vent. Give us a moment while Val switches over to the video. You can't hear the volume. I think you have to unplug your headphones. I can play the video on this end if needed, Val, if the sound is a requirement. Oh, is it not playing? Okay, the sound is not. We were just trying to, uh, just in the beginning, because it's, it's very yeah, exciting it's a, <laughs> to hear everybody when they first see it. But Hannah no, can continue from here. No biggie. All right, so that these vents release hot, mineral rich water and the animals that are found at these vents they can withstand extreme temperatures and pressure toxic minerals no sunlight and these animals still thrive at these hydrothermal vents so you may be wondering how is this possible well this is possible because there's types of bacteria that live near the vents or around the vents or on the vents and they convert these toxic vent minerals into usable forms of energy through a process called chemosynthesis. So after chemosynthesis, the bacteria process all those chemicals into a food which the animals can then eat. And so we're getting into the part of the video, you can start to see some crabs maybe. Do you guys see any of those little crabs there? Um, so we also saw some worms and some isopods and shrimp and snails living on the vent and nearby the vent as well. And in a minute here, you'll see, here we go, here's a close up. You can see uh, some of the crabs. We saw these white and brown colored crabs. We're not sure if they're different species or the same species and we did sample them during the cruise. We don't have the results yet. So to be determined, that oval thing you see on the top right-ish corner, that's an isopod. And I wanted to point out that our mapping coordinator on this research expedition did a great job. He guessed the location of the vent within 10 meters of where we actually found it, which was really, really good. And then we decided to take the temperature because we wanted to see how hot this vent actually was. And you can see here on the lower part of the screen, the temperature is going up and up. It's at 105. Now it's at 202.7. All right, so 202.7 was our max temperature, which is equivalent to 397 degrees Fahrenheit. So, oh man, that is hot. Go ahead and stop it there. Okay. Thanks for taking us on that expedition, Hannah. That was really exciting. Um, and it's really important to note that every dive into the deep sea teaches us something about our oceans. Did you know that we actually know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the seafloor here on Earth? And if you want to check out more, you can see how little has been explored here in American Samoa. This is a map of on the deep sea coral and sponge um, portal hosted by NOAA's deep sea coral program. And on this map are all the points where um, 
deep sea corals and sponges have been observed or maybe collected. Um, right now, the data from the Nautilus cruise is being annotated by deep sea experts at the Hawaii Undersea Research Laboratory. And they're going to be helping us figure out exactly what we're seeing during the Nautilus cruise, what their scientific names are, and whether it is any new species that were discovered during this cruise. We're hoping to add more to the records um, so that we can learn more about the, the deep sea in American Samoa and also share it with all of you and our partners. Um, we're hoping to continue our partnership with the Ocean Exploration Trust, as well as our local partners and other federal partners, to continue these types of expeditions. As you can see, there's so much more left to explore. And maybe you can join us on future cruises, either by telepresence or maybe even as part of the crew. And with that, I think we can take some questions, Joe. All right, excellent. Let's go for some of those questions. So we do have the Slido room open. You can put some questions in there. I also see the questions have been coming in uh, via the chat as well. So either one of those are great spots for questions. And so the number one question in Slido has been voted right up to the top. You mentioned um, some of those opportunities that can be available uh, on ships like the Nautilus. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those um, opportunities? Anna, do you want to take that or do you want me to? I could jump in and talk about it uh, a little bit yeah. as well, if that's easier. I actually got to spend... Hannah, Hannah is also muted. She was trying to talk. She must unmute herself. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Joe. And if there's anything additional that I can add, I'll add after. Okay, perfect. I spent two weeks on board the Nautilus. Uh, off the coast of California, exploring the Monterey Bay uh, National Marine Sanctuary as a science communication fellow. So absolute blast to be able to be in the control van as everything was happening live, see that octopus garden being discovered in real time, and then share it out with the whole world. So that's one opportunity, uh, applying for something like that. There's other opportunities to come on as interns for video, for science, um, for ROV pilot as well. So there's all kinds of really cool opportunities through the ocean uh, exploration trust that you can apply for each year during each season uh, of those expeditions. Thanks, Joe. And just to That's add to true. that, so our... on this crew, oh, <laughs> so in, in our cruise, we did have an intern, a data manager intern. We had a navigation intern who was a grad student. Um, and then we also had, like Joe mentioned, an ROV intern as well. Go ahead, Bob. I was just going to mention, NOAA also has Teacher at Sea programs. So if you're an educator watching this and want to go aboard a cruise, um, you should check out that program as well. It's a really great opportunity to go out and explore. I've dropped the Nautilus jo uh, joining information in the chat, and I'll also add Teacher at Sea. Thanks, Val. All right, great. so RG is curious about the ROVs. You mentioned that as it gets into warmer water, um, it can't operate for too long. Uh, RG's wondering if you can elaborate on that a little bit. What what can happen if if as the water temperature warms for the R ROV? So when the R, sorry, I didn't know. Were you talking about? There's a delay. Okay. So when the ROV Hercules is only rated to go ideally to about 100 meters, our shallowest dive ended at 70, um, which is pretty warm. And, it, and it's an issue because not only is the water temperature warmer, but because of all the machinery on the ROV that it takes to operate it, it heats up. And so that, in addition to the warming of the water, it, those two together cause it to overheat. And if it gets too hot, it won't operate properly. So the ROV pilot, if something really bad goes wrong and it heats up too much, it could melt something and then it'll, it can malfunction. So it's just not safe. So we just try to avoid that altogether. Um, yep. All right. We've got Christine joining us. She sent in a question via the chat and she's curious about plastic pollution. So when I was off the coast of Monterey, we definitely found some plastic pollution, some old fishing nets. We found, you know, some pop cans and other things that had made their way uh, down, you know, three kilometers deep. 
did you find any evidence of plastic pollution or, or other uh, pollution uh, on your dives? We did. We found on three dives, I can't remember the third, but off Ta'u and off Anu'u, we did see trash. We saw a rug and then some large piece of plastic of some sort. And both of these, when we saw them, were over a thousand meters deep. So it was pretty shocking to see marine debris at that depth. And that is not a good sign. But we did, we did see some as well, unfortunately. All right. Yeah, the most interesting thing we came across was a Dr. Pepper can. It was just kind of, I don't know, jarring to see that kind of pop up out of nowhere uh, in such a remote uh, wow. location. Uh, Cheryl, Cheryl's tuning in and wondering about the temperature of the vents that uh, are there. Yeah, so the one we saw, um, that one got up to almost 400 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty warm. But there are other types of hydrothermal vents like black smokers and white smokers, and those get even hotter. Um, I believe those can get up to 1,000 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, which is much, much hotter. So this vent that we saw is actually one of the cooler ones, believe it or not. <laughs> All right, so Eve is in the slider room and Eve is wondering about the ROVs. She's heard that they're pretty heavy. How uh, are you able to move them around, put them into the water? How does that happen? So I don't know if Val, if you can go back to the photo of us deploying, that might help in the explanation. So as I mentioned, both ROVs are in tandem, so they're connected by one cord. And so Hercules goes in the water first off a side crane off the side of the ship, and I'll bring that photo up in a minute here. And then Argus goes off the back of the ship on what's called an A-frame. And so it's shaped kind of like an A, and it lowers back towards the water, and then Argus is deployed uh, that way. And so they are very heavy, so these cranes and the A-frame help they, they hold that weight and teeter it, but you also have to have personnel on the ground, which you can see here in this photo, they all have hard hats on and life vests on just in case there is an accident or the boat sways and someone gets knocked over. Um, so people are still needed to help guide the ROV either back down on the floor or as it goes up um, to try to get it over the edge or when we're just getting it over the edge, especially for Hercules, because it's coming on the side of the ship. Um, just to make sure that it clears the bars and then they can tell the operator of the crane to then lower the ROV down. And all this is done very, very slowly. And one thing I didn't mention in the presentation is that before we go on a dive, we always check the weather conditions. And the weather conditions not only have to be good prior to the dive and deploying the ROVs, but we also have to look into however many hours into the future when we plan to end the dive. Because if the conditions are going to get increasingly worse within those few hours, then we will not deploy the ROV. So we need to make sure that the weather conditions are good to deploy and retrieve. All right, we've got Lena in the Slido and she is wondering about the light of the ROV. How much do you think that affects uh, the marine life that you encounter? You wanna take this one, Val? Sure. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of different responses for some things. It doesn't seem to bother them. Some of the things like corals and sponges actually don't have eyes or ways to sense, um, sense light. Others um, are definitely adverse to it. So I've seen sharks kind of skirt the light. Same thing with some of the larger fish. Um, and other things will move once you illuminate them. Um, I don't think there's been any studies on on how, how it might affect them um, and their behavior. But we do see some responses. It really depends on the animal. All right, Michelle's hanging out with us. She's in, sent us in a question. She's wondering about marine mammals found within the sanctuary. What kind of marine mammals can we find? Oh gosh, we have humpbacks that come in every um, winter. So. When I first got here, it was very exciting. Every trip out to Sangatelli, we had humpback whales, and we'd see mamas and calves um, and whole pods. Um, we are lucky enough to see some nice full breeches, um, tail flaps and stuff. We also have um, spinner dolphins, and there's a number of other marine mammals um, in the unit, and then there's another a number of other marine mammals that are found in the area. Um, 
and our partners at DMWR um, and some other organizations um, focus on um, those broader marine mammal surveys as well. And if you're interested in learning about the marine mammals of the entire National Marine Sanctuary System, we just hosted one on Monday, one as in a live interaction about this topic specifically, which will be recorded and put up on Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants YouTube channel with the Sanctuaries playlist. So definitely more to learn about marine mammals in sanctuaries. And I think for National Marine Sanctuary of Americans, Mo, I did highlight the humpback whale because they have such a long migration track to get to American Samoa. That's all right. right. All the way from Antarctica. All right. So I've got a question for both of you from Julie. Um, maybe you can each take a turn. What was the most exciting thing um, to you anyways that, that was found during this expedition? What was the most exciting thing you saw or discovery, marine life? What, what excited you the most? So I would say say for geology was all the the really cool lava rock formations um especially at Aunu'ut, um swains and i believe it was um at rose atoll and also one interesting fact that i didn't expect to see i've never heard of or seen we did see at a couple of our on a couple of our dives um, what almost looked like a mass die-off really deep in the ocean at about between 2,000 and 1,000 meters deep. Um, and we weren't sure what it is. So it was exciting because it was something new and kind of a mystery. And so we took some samples. So I'm excited to see um, what those analyses say. Um, and then as far as, of course, the, the Vailu event was super exciting, um, definitely. And any other cool creatures? Seeing the six gill shark was pretty, that was pretty cool too. <laughs> yeah. I have to agree. I'm a fish nerd. So I like to focus on fish and their habitat. So the six gill shark, and then there was another shark. I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, deep sea shark shark that was observed too. So that was kind of exciting for me, but also just seeing all of the different types of fish and the habitats they're using. I could watch this stuff all the time. Um, but I think for me, I think mo one of the most interesting things um, is the really dynamic nature of the Vailu um, seamount and the fact that it's constantly changing and that the cone is growing and that new hydrothermal vents pop up. So the one that um, Hannah showed you was actually in a different location than where the Okeanos Explorer found one in 2017. So I think just the fact that it changes so quickly and that there's animals that come in and colonize, that's kind of my favorite part. All right. So I'm going to grab one more question from Slido and one more from the chat bar. And this one's come up a lot in Slido. It's been upvoted to the top uh, a few times. This is uh, from Liam. and a few of the viewers are curious about who who funds or sponsors some of these expeditions. I can go ahead and answer that one. Um, these expeditions were funded by NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and funds for these telepresence expeditions were given to Ocean Exploration Trust, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration to administer the, this research over the span of a number of years. So each year, uh, specifically Ocean Exploration Trust works with a few different sanctuaries with their research vessel Nautilus. They also try to do remote operations with um, other partners using an autonomous surface vehicle in the Great Lakes. And a part of this series that we're doing with Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants will go over all of these expeditions. So stay tuned if you're interested in learning more about all of these telepresence expeditions. All right, very cool. Well, I'm really tempted to wrap up with our last question being from Samantha, and she wants to know if you saw Aquaman. But I think instead, I'm gonna go with June. She has Annie uh, joining from South Pacific Academy in American Samoa, and they're asking how each of you got your start. Uh, in this type of this type of work, this type of science. 
so I can go first. So I originally decided to become a marine biologist when I saw the coral reef um, aquarium at the Shedd Aquarium, and I was just instantly hooked, seeing live sharks and fish. Um, and then ever since then, I've just been pursuing that. So that included um, taking a lot of science classes in high school, doing some summer camps in marine science, uh, then getting my bachelor's, uh, getting a biology degree, and then a master's degree um, in environmental science, and then getting a lot of experience. So if you're interested, I would say look for internships, um, get some experience, and definitely all the science classes you can take, math too, um, is really helpful. So for me, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was a kid. I was always intrigued by the ocean. I was always fascinated by the ocean. And when I started college, I decided to study oceanography because it involved the ocean and I, I love the ocean. And while I was in my undergraduate, I did internships. As Val said, I strongly recommend that as well. And in doing those internships, I did a variety. I did one in an aquarium. I worked with a physical oceanographer in Alaska. And then I did one um, working with Noah's Restoration Center in the Caribbean with corals, and that really intrigued me. And that's when I kind of figured out exactly what I wanted to do. And then I continued on to grad graduate school, and and here I am today. All right, great. Well, I'm going to throw things over to Hannah in just a minute, but first I want to do a big shout out to everybody who tuned in to today's webinar. Thanks for all the great questions. Thanks for playing along with the Slido as well. Obviously a huge thanks uh, to Val and Hannah for joining us today. Thanks for taking us on a little virtual expedition uh, to check out uh, the National Marine Sanctuary. Pretty incredible. I love that six gill shark. And I'm gonna throw things over to Hannah. Awesome, thank you, Joe. And thank you, Hannah and Val so much for that great presentation. I really loved the video and the narrating that you did over that. It made me feel like I was actually a part of the expedition. If you missed part of this recording or are interested in the past recordings that we've done, we are hosting our recorded interactions on Exploring by the City or Pants YouTube channel. There's going to, there is a playlist called NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuary, where you will be able to find this one as well as all of our past ones. Give us a few days to get this one processed and up there, but it will be there. I also want to talk about the upcoming live interactions that we are doing. So the one that you tuned into today is a live interaction geared for students with Exploring by the Your Pants. We have a number of them coming up, which I will touch on in a second. If you are an educator, we also run the National Marine Sanctuary's webinar series uh, geared for educators on how to use marine science in the classroom. For, I also wanna promote Exploring by the City Your Pants. They are a great way to bring explorers, scientists into your classroom on a variety of topics. And then NOAA also runs a once a month uh, distance learning opportunity with Ocean Today. So those are all upcoming live interactions that you can partake in as a student or an educator. And here is our next one with Exploring by the Sea Your Pants. This is also, um, this expedition is also in partnership with Ocean Exploration Trust and the Nautilus. They visited two National Marine Sanctuary sites in Northern California, Cordell Bank and Greater Fairlawn, and we'll be reviewing uh, that expedition on May 27th. So please join us if you are interested in that. And following this program, after we conclude the webinar, you'll be prompted to take a brief survey. If you are an adult and able to spend just a few minutes on this survey, it really helps us guide our programming in the future with the topics you're interested in and how you thought this went. So we would greatly appreciate any feedback that you're willing to share. With that, I want to thank Joe, Hannah, and Val greatly again for the incredible content that you have shared with all of us today. And I also want to thank all of the attendees for joining and asking such great questions. I hope you all have a great rest of your day, and this concludes today's webinar. Thank you, Hannah and Joe. Thank you, everybody. That was great. Thanks so much, Val. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you. That was really fun. Good stuff. That was great. <laughs> yeah, thanks for joining us today. Where are you? Are you in Samoa?
Yeah, we're teleworking right now because of the whole COVID situation, but we are on island working from home. <laughs> well, signal came through really well for that. That's great. Good stuff. Yeah, it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> we were a little worried. <laughs> <laughs> no, it worked out great. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, yeah, hopefully, I, I, I don't know if we're gonna, what the plan is, we might revisit some of these expeditions. We might do some more with them. So we'll see, we'll see what Hannah and the team come up with. Cool. But it was great we to have you join us. We follow these stuff too. So uh, let us know if there's other opportunities. I think we potentially be up for shallow reef exploration. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks Enjoy again. the rest of your day. Bye, you too. Bye. Yeah.